rights and the pursuit, pursuit of the SDGs. And we had a fulsome discussion on tackling corruption and crime. But uh, let me turn now to the two uh, moderators who will give you a little more flavor of the discussions we had. Of course, whenever you summarize a set of discussions, you miss out much of the richness of the interactions that took place in the room. But I hope you'll be able to capture some of that. And Dr. Lewis um, uh, from the University of Leuven in Belgium, I give you the floor first to tell us what happened in your room and what would you like to share with this audience? Thank you very much. A very good question. Always, um, no, yeah, we, ha we had a very, very lively and very interesting discussion in our session. Uh, too rich to summarize, but um, I will try. Everything is impossible until it's done, said Mandela once in Rome. So I will try. I, I summarize it in five main points. Um, first, we heard inspiring stories from uh, Sri Lanka and Mauritius about how they are implementing the SDGs and, and, and working uh, to adapt their institutions to this challenge. Uh, and the challenges are quite different. Um, Sri Lanka is um, maybe the world record, uh, uh, has the world record of the number of ministers, 51 ministries and 425 agencies. Um, and most of them should be involved in the SDGs. So there's an enormous fragmentation, and which is a huge challenge. Uh, Uchita, uh, Uchita, our speaker, is doing an incredible task uh, to bring all these actors together and, and mapping this uh, huge fragmentation challenge to, to bring things together. In Mauritius, it is a bit easier maybe, but um, what they have is very important. The, the, the prime minister office is coordinating the implementation of the SDGs. And which is, and we've heard it so many times, this is the key to success. It's, um, it's, it's more important even uh, than the question, should you do it in a decentralized or in a centralized way? It's prime minister involvement is, is very important. But also the involvement of civil society and business because they can create the, the pressure, pressure that is necessary to, to move forward, to change and also parliaments are important. The second point is about the long-term dimension. Um, in, in my short introduction, I said that most of the states, in my view, I think have a majoritarian uh, political system, which means um, after five years, there's often a complete flip-flop to another system, to another party, and uh, some institutions can be undone. Anyway, it's, it's a nice system, but it's very difficult to, to really do long-term work. So you have to find ways around that. And one of the ways that was mentioned was to always try to involve also the opposition party in parliament, involve the whole parliament. So when a new government comes in, then um, there is still some ownership and, and not everything will change. The third point is uh, working across departmental silos. Um, and we need these silos because they give structure, they give clarity and transparency and accountability. But we need to, at the same time, to teach them to dance together, to work together better. And for that, we need building trust. Uh, it means that we all need to step out of our own comfort zones and our mi mindsets. And well, th this is really important because if we can't get governments departments to work together. How can we expect from society to do this and to, to, to take this holistic approach uh, uh, to the SDGs? So we need to mobilize civil servants uh, to change, uh, creating awareness, but they also need new skills. Uh, for example, the skill to deal with complexity. Fourth point is then related to that, ed education and training. Uh, we talked a long time about that, very important. They are both important, but not the same. Education is at schools, training is on the job often, and it's more targeted uh, oriented. Involvement of academia, it was said, is important, and more than it happens now. But I would say, and I think it's, it's a conclusion that was shared, especially those who are really understanding how administration organizations function, with their irrationality, ambiguity, the power games and their fears. 
and because I, I'm, I'm myself a hybrid between um, practitioner in the in the government and uh, an academic, and I know how many academics do not really understand this, and they, they try to develop models um, which don't work. So we need to involve them more, but then in a, in a clever way. And last but not least, um, I think there was also a consensus that uh, implementation of the SDGs is not a project, project issue, not a linear issue, it's a process. And in this process, we should combine careful, good thinking, deep analysis, designing models, doing scenarios, but at the same time, in parallel, make the small steps we can do already um, because there's no time to wait. And, and there will never be one uh, big design that will solve everything. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. The discussion on training was music to my ears as head of the UN Institute on Training and Research. But I know the difficulty. Everyone he pays lip service to training, but those who are sent for training often treat that as a kind of diversion from their main activity or the main operational activity of the type they are doing in the various ministries they are. And they feel that this is a kind of diversion from what they normally do. So getting that change in attitude and mindset in its application to their day-to-day -day work has always been a, ch a great challenge. I'll talk about a little if, we, if I have the time. But I wanted to spend just a few minutes if any of the panelists would like to add to that. Uh, did, does Rubina or Uchita or Marion or Raymond, do you want to add a little more to that to give it flavor? I'll give you a minute, a minute and a half each if you so uh, want it, and then we'll move on to the second panel. That, do I see any of the panelists wanting the floor to uh, add more flavor to what Lewis has said? Uchita? Yeah, tr <laughs> Nikhil, as I said in the panel, what we are trying to do is we are trying to look at the uh, awareness and the capacity of decision makers of various different levels and also uh, decision makers like the, uh, from politicians, administrators, uh, public servants, plus the civil society uh, uh, to be brought into a level understanding uh, and comprehension of the planning to implementation. But there's a second process that we are doing is the total education system looking at it uh, and addressing that the education system must be geared towards the transformation mindset and mindfulness must come through that and embedding it. So the curriculum, addressing the issues of curriculum is as much as important because 20, 30, 14 years and at least two to three governments can change within that. And we will have various paradigm shifts happening. So basically what we are doing is we are looking at both the training to gear the skill set and aptitudes and the understanding in coherence with the transformation. Second is the transformational mindset change as well. Thank you, Chita, for reminding us of the importance of education for keeping this agenda alive. Uh, Marion, would you like to add to what was said? Or uh, Rubina? Or Raymond? A minute? Yes, no, just to say one point I also made in the panel, which I... Uh, uh, the Committee of Experts on Public Administration uh, from the United Nations was on the role of uh, decentralization in implementing the SDGs. Uh, and uh, the point they were making was there is no golden rule to, uh, as to how much of the SDGs should be implemented at the local level. But what matters is that the kind of powers and resources that go with implementation uh, are actually existing at the local level, otherwise you might just uh, stall implementation. But they are also very much in agreement with the role of uh, local authorities uh, to implement the SDGs as being close to communities, but that there has to be some uh, progressive evolution. Uh, thank you. Raymond, if you're in the room. Uh, just to go back to uh, Nikhil, what you already summarized, uh, to add <coughs> a little component to it. I think when it comes to the SDG implementation, 
the transformation process means we have to find ways to put in place mechanisms for interministerial policy coordination, mechanisms for our governments to talk to business, to talk to civil society, and that's institution development and the capacity building, the skills, knowledge, abilities, where UNITAR already is active in. Ideally, for, for UNITAR, together with UNDESA, both could be done jointly, that the institutions are helped or being helped to create these mechanisms, and then the people uh, trained so they can use the mechanisms. And as you said, oftentimes, people come to a training and feel, why should I go? Or they've been assigned to go to a training and they don't quite know why they should go to take a training. So if we could identify the performance gap in the ministries, what is it they don't know? What is it their people cannot do? And based on that, we can then design training programs or seminars. It will be much more motivating and the idea would be, of course, that they would go back to their job site and help improve in the SDG implementation. So I think if we could just, in that sense, support each other, it would be uh, very useful. Thank you. Robina, would you like to say something too? She's probably not here. So I, I'll turn now to uh, Beatrice. Beatrice, if you could also give a summary of what transpired in your wonderful room. Thank you, Chair. Um, we had um, three speakers from very different contexts um, who, who all, I think they, they illustrated um, the point that has already surfaced about each, each country having its own priorities and its own needs. Um, speakers from Tuvalu, from Dominican Republic, and from Papua New Guinea. And we had a, a fourth um, contributor. We were lucky to have uh, someone who has been researching uh, governance and the link between governance and aid. So uh, that was followed by a number of contributions. I'm going to give my comments broadly following the four questions we had. Needless to say, they were interrelated, so you know they overlapped uh, one with the other. The first question was around challenges in delivering public services um, and some innovative practices. Um, interestingly, the, there was less time spent on the challenges than, than I thought might be the case, which is really very encouraging. But we started, of course, with recognizing the, the tremendous impact that environmental um, catastrophes can have. Um, the case of Tuvalu where um, you know, a huge proportion of the population lives it rurally and is very seriously affected um, by any disaster. Um, and I will talk later about some of the ways that they have tried to tackle that. There was a general comment made about the need for capacity, for more capacity, but a specific area that was highlighted was in, in both acquiring data and then analyzing data, using the data when, once you have it. Um, it's quite clear that, I mean, peop people identified challenges, as I've mentioned, environmental ones, e some highlighted economics, some social priorities, some the sheer complexity of dealing with their geographical situation. But the point about the, the having effective data analysis capacity is that it helps you to decide what to focus on, what really matters, um, and to plan for the future. It shows you where the weaknesses are, and it helps you to prioritize. So that, that was seen as a, as a fundamental capacity that, that was lacking. As I said, um, people didn't give long lists of challenges, um, but rather they set out what they had done to try and tackle those and, and to deal with them. Um, and these are, are probably coming out in a slightly random order. <laughs> but um, I'm, as, the, as I know, now know the panelists will have a chance to comment, they can, they can make more sense of this if they wish to. Um, I mentioned Tuvalu and the, um, 
impact of cyclones, etc. One thing they have done, uh, initi initiated by the government, is to set up a survival fund so that money is allocated, is set aside, and, and will build over time in order to address future disasters. A second example um, from the D Dominican Republic was looking, taking a long, hard look at existing systems, institutions, etc., redesigning them to be more appropriate for what you're trying to achieve through the SDGs. Their example was looking at the way planning units had built up in separate ministries over the years, trying to pull that together to streamline it and also moving from a more localized evaluation um, system to a national evaluation system so that there could be uh, dialogue across, you know, with a common language and, and there is a bigger picture rather than this fragmented approach. Um, the issue about localizing SDGs, we, we heard from Tuvalu about how, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure no offense, would, as a small country, but spread over a huge area, they had managed to have every island create its own plan, which was aligned with the national plan, which is aligned with the SDGs. And, and we've just heard mention of SEPA, and that was very much the kind of approach that I think SEPA was hoping for. So when we use an expression like localized in the community, that, that really exemplifies um, what we were hoping might happen out of this. We then came on to what I can really describe as a, as a sort of broad area of whole of government approaches and leadership. And I think it was very firmly recognized that you, you need a whole of government approach, but that that needs the leadership to initiate, to drive, to motivate, and I think what came through very strongly is, is also leaders, high-level decision-makers engaging in accountability. In other words, completing the circle and reporting on what has happened, you know, making information available to the public. Um, we heard mention of implementation of the leadership code, you know, which in one country, which goes to um, the standards expected of leaders, etc. Um, a number of people referenced coordination units or high-level commissions, but, but a body to which uh, people are accountable and the, the body is tracking process, making decisions, etc. So it's pulling it up to a high level to ensure that there is progress. Um, and that might include, in, in one case, for example, quarterly reports to Parliament uh, or indeed to Cabinet. On the question of engagement, um, I, I think there were many examples of broad consultation, which was truly encouraging, involving the whole community, in some cases formalizing that with representatives of women and children in the high-level commission and, and so on, or, or in the consultative body. Um, one lovely image of school children being asked to draw the, the future they wanted to see, which was from the Dominican Republic. Um, a, a reminder that um, unions and other representative bodies are part of this consultation process and, and need to be involved. And another example in terms of uh, raising uh, public awareness and understanding and involvement was uh, a newspaper produced uh, by Cuba, which was more or less freely available to everybody, setting out what the plans were, giving them a, an opportunity to comment and contribute, and then taking those amendments on board. Um, I mentioned that there were a number of overarching bodies. Uh, one was described as an education pact, and I commented on the word pact, because that you know, it's not just going out and publishing what you plan to do and then never saying any more about it. If it's a pact, it implies commitment and accountability that you have actually done what you said you were going to do. And I think in that same area, it led to almost unexpected dividends in terms of working with universities. And I think 
I think that is an area that people touched on, that sometimes actually when you have the courage and you go out and engage with the community, it does pay dividends. You find resources, people, you know, intelligence, expertise that can actually help you with what you're trying to achieve. Um, and um, taking, you know, so uh, there was a further comment about the need for ongoing uh, consultation and engagement. It's not a one-off activity, and I think uh, it was from Norway, the encouragement uh, where they have initiated an ongoing uh, public debate on budgets. Um, the last point was around um, tackling corruption, uh, which was a particular project from Papua New Guinea, um, Phones Against Corruption, which of course has an element. This is enabling the citizen through their mobile phone uh, to highlight um, securely from their point of view uh, points of corruption. And it's enabled them uh, to track uh, finances, to see where the money is going. Um, it's been a targeted initiative that has paid them dividends. So I think very briefly summing up, the key issues have been about leadership, focus, engagement, and a whole of government approach. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. I'll give the floor for about a minute, a minute and a half, to Mr. Teo, to Elibeth Para, and to Sam Ezepan. So, Mr. Teo, if you're here in the room, would you like to add to that? Okay, then I'll go on to Elibeth Para. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question that was given in the panel was um, what we are doing to get uh, private sector or other institutions on board with implementation of the SDGs. And um, as I was giving the answer, I forgot to mention that also institutions do have a legal framework for their existence. So, for example, Ministry of Health is in charge of the health services in the country. Ministry of Education is charge of the education in the country. So if the SDGs are being implemented in their national planning, why wouldn't they be in involved? You know what I mean? So you have to, um, another element is for the highest political level to um, show them, well, this is your legal framework. You exist to do this and this and this in our country. So it's kind of um, giving them a, uh, accountability, so um, it, demanding accountability from the institutions. So in our case, um, I was answering the person that gave the question, we don't have uh, issues with public institutions wanting to be involved, but in case any other uh, country here has this issue, well, just go back to the legal framework that created the institutions, and you can demand from them, hey, this is what you're supposed to do legally, so let's go ahead and work together to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Adiba. Uh, Sam Erifan, yes, please. Thank you, uh, moderator. I just wanted to highlight uh, a little bit on the, on the establishment of the, the Tuvalu Survival Fund. This came into, into reality after the, the cyclone Pam that hit Tuvalu in March 2015. And this was uh, due to the slowness of the arrival of funds and the disbursement of the funds. So the government uh, decided to set up this uh, fund and it kick-started it off with uh, $5 million so that uh, when the next disaster strikes, there is uh, funds available just to be dispatched straight away. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is the implementation of what we want, especially after the lessons learned from the Cyclone Pam. I mean, uh, it is now nearly two years after the Cyclone, and uh, we wanted to build seawalls. And we got the funds for the seawalls nearly a, a year ago, and not even one brick has been set up for the seawalls. So it's this uh, problem from start to implementation that's a really a big uh, question that should be addressed instead of uh, you know talking all the time and doing nothing. It's two years now. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Sam. Now the floor is yours. And I would encourage all of you, uh, regardless of the issue, to talk about it, but do so in three minutes. And I'd really encourage you to try and come out with a recommendation which could be captured by the organizers of this conference as a sort of conclusion, a thread of discussions leading to a conclusion on some of these issues. I see the Under Secretary General Wu is also in the room, uh, Under Secretary General of DESA. Under Secretary General, during the course of yesterday, many people talked about China and the success, uh, particularly in the area of poverty eradication in China. I was wondering if any time you're ready, if you could share some of the success, the reasons for success in China in terms of its institutional um, sort of uh, causality, in terms of public service delivery, in terms of the success story of listening to the voice of the people, in terms of tackling corruption and crime and the other things that were discussed on readying your institutions, on creating new institutions, on leaderships and the challenges and opportunities. I think the six countries would love to hear that reflection from someone who knows China really well as to what was it uh, in the last two, three decades and the changes that have taken place in the institutional side which led to the spectacular success story of China. But whenever you're ready, USG, you could uh, talk to us about that. So now the floor is open uh, on the issue of public institutions, the types of issues that have come up in these two compartments, in the two rooms, Arakam and the Grand Ballroom. So please take the floor and let's hear your views and uh, let's have this dialogue going. Yes? Yes, go ahead. Somebody's coming to help you. Okay, this is working. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Amjad Omar. I am the lead on ICT for SIDS partnership. I wanted to, uh, to give some comments about the very good uh, idea that uh, Mr. Chair has just presented about training. Uh, I am a university professor, so uh, I do training <laughs> and education. Um, what we have learned is that uh, the notion of using gamification for the purpose of training is extremely, extremely successful. Um, we have, for example, by working with some government officials, we have um, developed uh, and gamified a procedures manual. Uh, and a procedures manual is something that nobody actually wants to read. <laughs> it's very boring, a mind numbing type of an exercise. So we gamified it by uh, thinking about some scenarios where in order for these employees of the government, they had to know the procedures very well to get themselves out of, and they played this game over and over and over and over again, and they became extremely knowledgeable about uh, gamification. Uh, I'm sorry, about the procedures. We used the same approach of gamifying uh, procedures for in healthcare for nurses, where they use the gamification to take uh, to do simple things like. Uh, taking blood pressures and things of that nature. Once again, they keep doing things over and over again to get a better score, and that helps a lot. So uh, we have developed as part of the project that uh, I will talk about later on today, uh, a gamification of cost-benefit analysis for SDGs. So if somebody wants to implement a particular SDG, uh, they can uh, play this little game uh, that uh, helps them to reduce the cost of uh, implementation so that it can be a low cost by high but high impact uh, type of an effort. And I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but it appears to be a very interesting game where people s spend some time trying to lower the costs to maximize the benefit. So w what I'm saying is that uh, gamification is a very interesting idea for training and education, the, uh, the only thing that I want to mention is the one disadvantage of that is that uh, many government officials, uh, they don't like 
uh, the term gamification because they don't want to be blamed that their employees are being paid to play games at work. <laughs> so so, so that, that's, that's a totally different issue, but I do want to mention it that uh, it's a very effective approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are called the UN Institute for Training and Research, but the research we do is actually on training. And what is it that, what is the pedagogy of learning? What is it that people remember? And we've been uh, researching all these types of things, you know, on simulation, on gamification, on um, uh, multimedia use. The state of science now in training is that you can't hold the attention of an audience beyond seven to 10 minutes. And after that, what happens? How do you innovate so that people's attention on learning continues? And how do you evaluate so that people, when they go back, uh, it's not only the questionnaire that they fill up saying that, oh, that training was great, but nine, 10 months down the road, have they been able to apply some of that training to their daily work and so on? So there are many tools and training is constantly evolving and I'm sure more of these uh, things will come. It's the cross uh, section between human psychology on uh, learning and what is it uh, in the brain science which helps people remember what they learn. But that's a little aside. Uh, are there any other flags? Uh, Ambassador Wu? Thank you very much, moderator. I'm not the representative of China. <laughs> I'm the representative of the United Nations. Since, since you mentioned China is not officially represented here, I would like to share uh, what I've uh, got on a personal basis. We all know China was doing well uh, for implementing uh, Millennium Development Goals. Now, China is one of the 22 countries who volunteer themselves for national review in the United Nations. I think China's model cannot be copied exactly by other countries, but there are some key elements may be useful for our consideration. Number one is the top leadership the Chinese top leadership attached great importance to sustainable development. In September 2015, the president of China was there, uh, joined with the heads of states and governments of the world to adopt Agenda 2030. On that occasion, the president assured the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations, as China was planning for the 13th five-year plan, all the 17 goals will be in, in, incorporated into their own national plan. So this is something we have been talking about, localization of laws and localization of targets, or even legalize the goals and targets. The second step the Chinese government has taken is to set up a high-level mechanism is the mechanism that covers all the relevant government departments. They went one step further. That is to delegate the goals and targets that are most relevant to each government department as their own targets. They will have an internal review to see how the ministries are doing with their responsibilities. So this is a mechanism they have put into place. Now, I talk about, uh, if I may, um, eradication of extreme poverty. We, we understand China made great contribution to the reduction of extreme poverty over the past 15 years with the MDGs. How many people still remain under extreme poverty line China, 50 million. For other countries, it's a big number. For China, it's not really big. What is the plan for China? They plan to help the 50 million out of extreme poverty by 2020 instead of 2030. What they have been doing now one year has really passed. 
the first year of implementation of Agenda 2030. The official report is 10 million have already been successfully pulled out from extreme poverty. It's very encouraging. I went a little bit further when I was in China. What did you do? They say the first thing is disaggregated information. This goes back to the important issue we have been discussing about data and the statistics. Of the 50 million, you know they're poor. If you don't know why they are, they are poor, you are just paying lip service. To start with, you have to know whether they still remain poor because of a poor health. They could not afford medical care. Or because of the poor education, they could not read and write. So they're still poor. Or because they are living in the harsh natural conditions. No matter how hard they work, they cannot become prosperous or because of a disability. If you have that kind of information, you will have a focused solutions to each of the group. So this is the basic you need to help them. Take the persons with the disabilities, for example. In China, how many people with the disabilities? 80 million. It's the same population of Germany. What they did, they have already finished a year ago household to household survey to find out whether the disability will prevent them from doing anything or they still have some ability to work. Then they come back to have solutions to each group in each family. So this is first point, disaggregated information. Second is responsibility. This is the feature of a centralized government system. The central government has delegated the power and the responsibility to local governments and the government departments. I talk some to local officials, they say, Myself is responsible to help two households. I've been troubled how to do that. But all the officials and government departments, they have responsibilities to do so. So you can see the involvement is Im impressive. Thirdly, the Chinese government is fully aware some of the people cannot become prosperous, pull themselves out of poverty on their own. So by the end of the day, say by the end of 2020, maybe there are still several million people in China. They're still poor. Then the government will come to their rescue with the um, insurance um, funds or, or donations. So this is the scenario they have already have in place. I do not predict whether they will be very successful or not, but significant pro progress has been made. Some key elements may also be very, very important for other countries to consider. I'm not speaking on behalf of China. It's only personal view. Thank you. Thank, thank you, USG. Sorry, uh, sorry for taking you there. But this issue of poverty eradication, uh, and especially reaching structurally, structural poverty, in, in the SIDS context, those who are the remotest, how do you get them you know, a living income? Uh, that's an issue which has been debated a lot these days. And one theory is that if governments were able to give a supplementary income to the poorest of the poor, and reach them by, that's the most dramatic way of entering poverty. Brazil, for example, has experimented with Bolsa Familia with this conditional uh, cash transfers. I know my own country, India, is thinking of ending all subsidies and using the corpus of, by ending all subsidies, of giving 
a direct cash transfer to the poorest of the poor. Are these some of the things which are worth replicating in the most vulnerable insects, those who are remotest, those the artisanal fishermen who are dependent on fish stocks which are declining, those who live on distant islands, and what are the institutional and technological things? Can cash transfer take place through the mobile phone? Is there a banking system which can help them get the tra cash transfer? How do you identify those who need it most? Is that the most dramatic way of ending poverty? Is that going to be effective? So maybe we can have some discussion on that too. But I see the lady here, she had wanted the floor. I can't see your flag, so I'm sorry I can't identify you. Trinidad and Tobago. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Well, it's the first time that I'm speaking, so I must say thanks to the, the government of the Bahamas for having us here, and especially for those UN, I call them almost the faceless people, who work so diligently behind the scenes to get us here. So I just want to acknowledge appreciation for that. So Trinidad Tobago, I was asked to share for just a few minutes about our process um, in terms of this, our uh, sustainable, our national development strategy and how we've attempted to align the SDGs. And it's so interesting, the conversation, the way it's going thus far in terms of uh, challenges and possibly solutions to the challenges in public institutions. I think I have to say that first, we realize that we have to, we have to begin with an honest assessment of where we are at. And our document is actually called Vision 2030. That doesn't, doesn't sound particularly creative. But nevertheless, what we did was in the written document, we put it out there for everybody to see that we have had an interesting journey. We had to say that these were the times in our country where we are experiencing extremely extraordinary circumstances. We are an oil and gas based economy. And of course, those resources are depleting. And the standard of life that we were accustomed to, we simply do not have those resources coming in to help us to continue that standard of life. So we've had to say some sort of diversification strategy, some sort of policy, some sort of a clear plan to transform our society is an imperative. So we came up with five goals. And the five goals, the very first one, that I want to highlight is putting people first, nurturing our greatest asset, especially in the light of the conversation that we've been having thus far. We've got five goals. What we endeavored to do was to, and in the document you will see a table that puts the five goals and aligns it to the sustainable development strategy. We have some sustainable development goals, all 17, and see what fits. But I guess what's coming out is that as a country, and this conversation has been happening, you've got to prioritize, you've got to decide what you can really do and what you can really work with because it can become overwhelming to attempt to, to merge and to adapt all of these strategies and all of the agendas. So that's where we started. So we've come up with five and the second speaks to what is, is very key to us, promoting governance and service excellence, which is the issue of the challenges within our public institutions. So one example, you spoke about statistics. Maybe by about 2018, because we have already done the groundwork um, in terms of having a consultancy, the Swedes came in and looked at our, our central statistical office. And very soon it is to become an independent statistical institute for Trinidad and Tobago. Because we get the point, you've got to disaggregate statistics to ensure that your strategy is an alignment with your solution. Decision making that's based upon good facts is, a, is absolutely critical. We speak about building globally competitive businesses. That's another one of our goals. So we've had to look at what's happening in our town and country planning division, our division that manages the land use policy and that gives the construction permit. And at present, it's a two, it's a two tier process. There is one division in the ministry and then there's local government doing another part. So with the help of partners like the IDB, we are streamlining and attempting to automate the process so that local government will have its role to play and maybe possibly manage the entire process when the time comes. 
All of that should contribute to the ease of doing business within our country and investing. Again, helping the, the baseline, the economy, if we are going to be able to finance implementing sustainable development goals, yeah? Valuing and enhancing our environment, another goal. And again, we've had a lot of support from international agencies, international donors. But I wanted to just share a quick thought. Yesterday, the conversation went in a particular way. And I want to say uh, there are two sides to the coin that is called financing and funding as small island development states. And I must admit, it is not always the issue that the funding is not accessible or it's not there. We have found in our experience in Trinidad and Tobago that we have money that cannot be dispersed appropriately, cannot be used to achieve the outcome that we intend for a number of reasons, and that is a lack of capacity. So, if you do not have the appropriate financial mechanisms and frameworks, what happens is that money comes to you when you did not even craft an appropriate project document that takes you from A to Z. So the money came, and then you can't use it in the time frame that is required for your international partners to, to know and to trust you the next time around. So I, I heard Cuba and I heard many of the others, and I'm saying, yes, that is a challenge. But in some other scenarios, it is the need for proper financial mechanisms and support there. That's the kind of capacity building that we are talking about, yes? And then there's another side again to the coin, and I know a coin does not have three sides, but this is my make-believe coin. <laughs> the third side is that we've realized that we have to, I, I call it, manage international donors. So many people are coming at you to support you. Sometimes, if you do not have one focal point, then the right arm doesn't know what the left arm is doing, so you have a coordinating uh, uh, problem right there and then. So what have we proposed? I'm from the Ministry of Planning, and what we've proposed is two things. Improving your governance structure, so we're talking about having a coordinating mechanism. Uh, we call it the center of government. Right now, it must, it, it, it's with the Office of the Prime Minister, but there are two other agencies, the Ministry of Planning as well as the Ministry of Finance, that must work together to strengthen that oversight and coordinating mechanisms so all know what's happening. The other thing we are doing is creating, for now we are calling it a, an international affairs unit. That name may change. But we've brought a consultant on board to help us create a mechanism, um, as the Under Secretary was speaking about that, uh, create a mechanism to ensure that the funds come through, all the funds come through, one uh, a, a body, and that we could all know what's happening. And it gives better oversight to the government and to the executive to, to align those resources appropriately. And the consultant that's coming in, um, you have to be careful who your consultants are, it's really an ex-public servant, an ex-PS, who understands because she's walked the road, she knows the journey and she knows the challenge. So even things like that. And finally, everything to me we have said so far in this symposium about trying to implement our sustainable development, sustainable development goals and our national development strategies and challenges that we are being faced, faced with, to me, undergirding all of that is the issue of values, behaviors, attitudes. You talked about it. I, I will pull it out and say that for the public service, we still have the challenge of instilling an uh, appropriate work ethic. How do I get people to buy in to, this is not the IDB's money, you know. If this is our money now when we've had the loan or if it's a donor, if it's TC resources, we've got to own the projects and want it to see the kind of outcomes that we, we put down on paper. So for us, my challenge and the challenge of my country is we are on the verge of carnival. If you know anything about Trinidad Tobago, <laughs> carnival is like, like happening. But that is one of the best well-oiled machineries you will ever see. How do we take that creativity, that innovation, 
that entrepreneurial spirit, that buying, that want, that passion to start something and to end it knowing full well that you've achieved the outcomes that you intended to achieve. Yes? I want to find a way to package that and inject that into all of my colleagues so that we all are on the same page. And at the end of the day, we do have a better opportunity in the face of really challenging times to realize our sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trinidad and Tobago. You talked about priorities. How do you set priorities? And earlier we had an intervention on cost-benefit analysis. Now the main problem, I think, in this mindset that we're looking for change uh, in implementing the SDGs is how do we establish a set of priorities based on the principles and the values and everything else that's enshrined in the SDGs? Many of these cannot be dollarized. How do you dollarize some of the values you talked about? How do you dollarize the uh, empowerment of women and girls? How do you dollarize reaching the furthest first? How do you dollarize various other aspects of this agenda of just societies? How do you dollarize peace? And uh, that's the challenge I think everyone has to grapple with, that how do you come up with a set of priorities which is different from the priorities on budget, on investments, on everything else you had in the past because of this value system which is embedded in the SDGs. And I think every country will have to grapple with this problem that you, you cannot have a dollarized cost and a dollarized benefit. You subtract the two and wherever it's the largest, you invest in that. It won't work that way anymore. And I think that's one of the challenges. I have a request here from St. Lucia, uh, Miss Annette uh, Liu, who uh, wants to be a discussant to share her own country's experience. Annette, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to all. Um, I've been asked to share St. Lucia's efforts um, towards implementing the SDG and the Samoa pathway and to have it integrated into our national development strategy. Um, thanks for this opportunity to learn and to share in, in this very important journey for SIDS. Um, I recall in 2011, as I sat in a conference in Chile um, and recall the recommendation made by Colombia to introduce the SDGs, and I thought that this was a very ambitious um, effort. And in fact, it did turn out to be very ambitious in that we have now moved from eight MDGs to 17 SDGs. While St. Lucia has not yet concretized a specific plan to guide its SDG implementation, some corresponding and guiding efforts are being undertaken. St. Lucia is participating in the ninth tranche of the UN Development Account project entitled Strengthen the Capacity of SIDS to Assess Progress in the Implementation of the Mauritius Strategy to Mitigate Risk and Reduce Vulnerability. St. Lucia's participation requires the development and application of the Vulnerability Resilience Country Profile, VRCP, which aims at mapping St. Lucia's vulnerabilities and assessing the country's ability to cope with its vulnerabilities utilizing the thematic areas of the Samoa pathway. The VRCP developed by UNDESA is being piloted in three countries, Jamaica, Barbados, and St. Lucia. And primarily, the VRCP will help states to track their progress in the implementation of the Samoa pathway. The VRCP could also be used as an analytical tool for identifying key issues and indicators for other international initiatives relevant to states such as the post-2015 development agenda and the implementation and the elaboration of the SDGs. Because of the interconnectedness of the Samoa pathway and the SDGs, the methodology used for the VRCP will help St. Lucia to prioritize the SDGs for implementation. In working towards the development of St. Lucia's VRCP, a core working group comprising relevant public agencies was established. So each agency has a focal point, and this is critical to, en to ensure continued interagency collaboration and intra-agency communication. To date, consultations held by this working group on, this, on the Samoa pathway has resulted in preliminary prioritization of the thematic areas. 
So already there's a thinking from the various agencies that will also be involved in the SDG implementation um, in terms of their views on our vulnerabilities under the respective um, thematic areas of the Samawa pathway. With reference to the SDGs, there's indication that a team of ministers will be put in place to help move the implementation process along. To support this ministerial team, there is an already established committee of permanent secretaries, and this committee will provide a needed link between the political and technical cohorts. Within the next two weeks, there will be a move to get official endorsement from the cabinet of ministers to develop the implementation plan for the SDGs. This recommendation for endorsement provides an outline of the relationship between the aforementioned committee of permanent secretaries and what is to be known as the SDG's National Coordinating Committee. It is worth noting that the proposed SDG's National Coordinating Committee will comprise the existing core working group under the VRCP. From the cabinet level, the Department of National Development has been appointed as the focal department to monitor implementation, while the Department of Sustainable Development will re retain the coordinating and implementing responsibilities. With respect to preparation for implementation, St. Lucia has participated in various capacity building exercises for technical officers, and it is anticipated that these officers will provide significant support to our external partners, such as the UNDP, which has indicated possible assistance for SDG roadmap development, and of course, St. Lucia will pursue this opportunity. Also at the agency level within the Department of Sustainable Development, as we are now preparing our annual budget, there is an alignment of the work program and budget planning with the SDGs. There is also ongoing efforts to establish an environmental information system. The challenge of available and adequate data for effective decision making and monitoring of progress is well known. The development of this system will be realized through a United Nations environment funded program, which focuses on monitoring the implementation of MEAs and, S and sustainable development in St. Lucia. It is envisaged that the actual data platform will be completed by the end of 2017. There are policies, strategies, and actions that pave the way toward the SDG implementation and integration in national planning, and I'll just mention a few. We have recently revised and approved our climate change adaptation policy. We have also completed a national adaptation strategy and action plan for the tourism sector, and we're a few months away from completing our third national communication report, and we are just beginning our first um, BUR. We are also looking at the review of our draft environmental management bill to incorporate emerging issues such as the SDGs and the Samoa pathway. There are ongoing discussions with NDC partnership on approaches to implement St. Lucia's NDC. We've also just completed a national energy transition strategy and we have a very vibrant national climate change um, committee which will lend support to the SDG national coordinating committee. The Forestry Department has recently hosted a public workshop on SDG 15 on land degradation neutrality. Finally, as it pertains to our strategies, specific reference can be made to St. Lucia medium term development strategy plan, which runs between 2012 and 2016, so it will be revised shortly. And this is a sectoral plan, which has goals, um, which in their own design has already incorporated and reflects the SDGs. These goals include indicators, verification means, and risk and assumptions. Just to highlight a few of the medium-term strategy plan against the SDG, for example, under the medium-term plan, goal number seven speaks to a more socially cohesive society and a safe and peaceful environment. And this reflects goal number 16 of the SDG, which speaks to peace, justice, and strong institutions. Goal number eight of the strategy plan, a significantly improved standard of living in the first rural and urban areas reflects SDG goal number one, no poverty. Goal number 10 under the strategy plan reflects reduced dependence on fossil fuels as an energy source, which mirrors goal number seven of the SDG, affordable and clean energy. And finally, goal number 16 of the strategy, increased levels of health and wellness among the population reflects SDG 3, good health and well-being. 
Looking briefly at public involvement, in addition to the consultations among public and other agencies on the Samoa pathway through the VRCP working group, there has been wider consultation organized by an NGO known as the St. Lucia National Trust. This consultation looked at prioritizing the SDGs, which this organization determined as impacting their organization directly. Finally, moving forward and bringing all the pieces together, we plan to ensure extensive engagement with all stakeholders, public, private, and community-based organizations, the academia, among others. And we will establish strategic partnerships that will result in a robust SDG implementation plan, and ultimately, to ensure that we have engagement at all levels. Thank you. Thank you, St. Lucia. Can we go back? to uh, the discussions around institutions and what are the kind of recommendations we can tease out from the two sets of discussions you heard. I'll enter a little controversial area because uh, that was controversial during the SDG negotiations, but we had a full discussion, I think, uh, Beatrice, in your particular room on the issue of corruption and good governance. In the SDG process, there was a lot of resistance in the room from several parts of the room to this issue because some felt that this was a whip to beat uh, countries with, but that was not the case. We did a, uh, we did a My World survey of the seven million responses, and they're still accumulating. I, I see people are still responding to that. Very large number put corruption and governance uh, issues at the top of the agenda, along with issues like education and health, which always came on the top of people's concerns. Corruption and governance was always up there. So reflecting on this, some of the things that we heard in your uh, particular room on the tools that are being developed uh, to tackle this in PNG, that was interesting. I wonder if people, in reflecting on this institutional aspect, can look at this big elephant in the room, uh, which is impacting a lot on this issue of public service delivery to citizenry. There's nothing more frustrating in any system to go for a public service and to see it delayed because of this understanding that you have to put something in an envelope for the person to give you a, ser a service. So I, I was wondering if anyone would like to talk about that in the subsequent uh, comments that we hear. Ambassador Decima Williams, I'd like to encourage you to because you have thought these issues for a while and I'd like you to also come in. Ambassador Faturi. If you would also like to comment on this at some stage, that would be wonderful. And the others uh, around this room would like to say something around this uh, issue of public institutions, good governance, corruption, and so on. Ambassador Faturi? Well, I just want to say amen to what you I just said. I think, uh, you know, before we used to say that uh, good governance, that was a concept that uh, it's been imposed upon uh, developing countries and that, uh, and that it wasn't a priority for us. But now on reflection, I think it is very much a priority issue for, for all developing countries for that matter. Because no matter, I mean, we've been saying that we have very limited resources, but if those resources are not put to to the, you know, are not utilized for the benefit of the majority of people, then there is something wrong somewhere. And I, in this morning's, <coughs> excuse me, in this morning's uh, one of the breakout groups, I think the observation was made that uh, sometimes the donor community are also on the lookout, especially for those uh, developing countries that uh, basically share good governance in terms of uh, no in, in terms of the utilizing of the resources so therefore they are also likely to be able to receive a lot of sympathetic consideration when they request assistance I think it's a very it's a real challenge and to pretend otherwise I think we are fooling ourselves and I, I think it's a, it's an issue that uh, and I'm glad that the Papua New Guinea was able to share with us what they are trying to do at the crown, because it's utilizing technology that our people can benefit from. And I think uh, to, to, to sweep it under the rug and think that oh, in, the, in, the, in the Pacific, for that matter, it's quite okay for you to give some money so that you can get services. 
I don't think that's the case. And I think as long as we am, admit that uh, it is very much a problem and we need to, to address it in a realistic way, I think we'll probably make some headway. While I have the floor, I was just going to say that one of the messages I always share with my staff is we all learn from borrowed knowledge. And I think today's sharing, we've been able to benefit from even what Tuvalu said. That is uh, you know, putting your own house in order first before, before you start telling others how to live their life. They have the survival fund. And more importantly, they put their own money in it. That, I think, uh, is something that we can also learn from. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Wu's sharing in terms of what China did, I think we can, I mean, we can learn a thing or two from this. I always say that we learn from borrowed knowledge, but more importantly, borrow an idea, adapt it, and also try and uh, you know, modify it, but more importantly, samboanize it so that we can own the idea and we can even have a trademark. And I think uh, what we try to do at the Pacific, uh, in the context of the Pacific is that there is what we have peer review. And I think the advantage of that is that we have uh, officials from other <coughs> Pacific countries who come and be a judge, whether it's our Ministry of Finance or the, the Bureau of Statistics. The important thing is they work side by side with their colleagues in Samoa. But more importantly, they're not trying to reinvent the world. They also, they're basically learning how you can do some of, how you can try and address some of these issues. So I think that can also be an important solution. But too often, we're, also, we're always trying to focus outside of our own immediate environments for solutions. Yet, some of the most practical solutions are, are, are amongst, uh, for, we can borrow from other members of our, if not our own community, at least from, uh, from other islands. Always say that there's no one has a monopoly on a good idea, and even to one has demonstrated that they can also, uh, they are quite capable of coming up with ideas. My own prime minister is on record as saying that there is no poverty in Samoa. There may be poverty of opportunities, but people are just getting lazy. Sometimes, because of technology, it's easier for you to pick up the phone and ring your relatives, maybe in New Zealand, send us some money. And yet, those people have to work in shifts at very cold uh, climates to get that money. And when you get it, it doesn't go to, to, you know, to, you know, to some productive uh, uh, area. So I, I think at the end of the day, we just have to be frank with each other. There's a lot of, there's been mention of uh, consultations to try and localize the SDGs. My question is, how much of that is effective a consultation? Are we taking on board what the people in the communities are saying? Or is it just so that we can put the tick? We consulted the community, so therefore there was a consultation. So we have to be honest with ourselves, and charity has to start. We have to put our own houses in order first before we can you know, expect others to help us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Being lazy is no sin. But I think for the Samoan rugby team to be lazy on the field is, is a sin. Uh, Ambassador Williams? Thank you very much, uh, Neil, and good morning to everyone. Afternoon now. Um, to be brief, I think the um, Ambassador of Samoa is correct. We've got to be honest. And we also had some presentations this morning from the representative from Trinidad and Tobago who led us in that direction. We've got, first and foremost, to be disciplined. We've got to the discipline of internal critique, the discipline, um, uh, and, to, and to be courageous, and to have, have um, a sense of what is strong and what needs to be strengthened in our societies. There is no doubt that overall our management issues, in managing information, managing money, managing time, can continuously be improved. Um, so that's the bottom line. What is the way in which we could approach it? Every country has to see what culturally they can be, how fast they can make the change or not, and what should the change be. I want to suggest that uh, a way to sidestep some of these issues of corruption and so, not sidestep, but to prevent it, is really to work closer with uh, the, uh, civil society. The civil society organizations really make an effort to spend their money wisely. 
And I think if the governments trust and have a good relation with civil society, especially the development organizations, you will find that they get on the ground, get into the communities, and spend and manage wisely. So the discipline uh, uh, of, uh, of managing our, our power in every little sphere that we are, and of course in um, working with a broader swath, which in this case is civil society. You also asked, Chair, about how do we dollarize some of what we do. I don't think we dollarize it. I think we valorize it. And um, I have a little bag here that could be, you know, the sort of bag of money that goes around the, the, the country. But it's a little bag of SDG buttons. And I want to say that if we become champions, you know, for the SDGs, if we become champions for clean and good government, we really will find that the, the cost of doing business is really around the value and the worth of the thing rather than the money attached to it. So my contribution in a very practical way is twofold. First of all, to raise up the importance of civil society organizations, development groups that are on the ground working to eradicate poverty in neighborhoods where the government apparatus might be weak or uh, not very present. And secondly, to um, encourage each of you here to come and get a pin and become a champion for the SDGs. And that will put a different spin on the dollarized um, nature of our development process. And closing, one more thing. Um, I wanted to just remind us about the uh, use of big data, going back to the conversation earlier on, on statistics and institutional reform. We are in the era of big data. You could look it up. It's a, it's a little bit scary in terms of the methodology by which information is now collected. All our cell phone conversations are monitored. All the conversations on the radio talk show programs are analyzed. So the methodology is a little bit worrisome to, in an ethical manner sometimes. But the use of big data for the promotion of the SDGs is a, a, an asset that is available to us, and I certainly hope that um, in going forward in terms of our institutional reforms, we're able to take it on, on board. Thank you. Are there any last uh, thoughts on this? Would someone like to comment? Keep it very short because my uh, sort of uh, grading as a moderator will depend on whether I can let you go for lunch on time or not. So, yes, uh, please. Thank you, Chair, and yeah. let me join other colleagues again to thank the government of Barbados for their hospitality, and of course the UN system that would have enabled us to get here. Um, it's my first time in Bahamas, and um, Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Bahamas. Um, but as you say, we is we. So um, I, I just want to um, rec first recognize the work done insists from the various presentations and it shows leadership and it also this forum I think is very important because it goes back to this issue of sharing best practices and, and this push for CISIS cooperation and partnerships that is so important. Um, so again th thank the organizers. On the issue of public institutions and this goes to our chair um, um, UNITAR, I think this scope to have a dedicated intervention bar training administration divisions. Um, they're there, we, they're there to train public officers. And I think a module can be easily developed, um, not an e uh, module, but something face-to-face -face because that interaction is gonna be critical. And I think the first phase could, should focus on the enabling institutions. So I packaged a number of institutions at the national level, such as finance, um, procurement, the legal affairs, um, the training institutions themselves, um, the education ministries. These are the, the, the agencies that are on the ground that work with sector ministries to drive implementation, to drive actual ex execution. So I, I want to put that as a practical um, outcome, and I think UNITAR being in the room and with DPAD, um, they scope for that. The other thing as well, um, my colleague from Sri Lanka made this oath uh, Ren mentioned the issue of transformation and the movement. He mentioned youth and he mentioned women. And I think it goes back to Ambassador Williams's point about civil society. 
at the Caribbean sub-regional, I believe it was June 2013, this whole issue of a Caribbean major groups movement, which we don't have, and which I think has been something that has been missing in terms of our, our whole advocacy at the international level. And I think the SDGs and the 2030 agenda, and this whole issue of not leave, leaving anyone behind, there's scope now to help mobilize, as a region, our major groups towards this agenda. And so again, I want to put that out there. And I think UNITAR can help also with the training. There are existing mechanisms that we can borrow from. Um, there are agencies in various islands and whatnot. And we have uh, the UN system on the ground. But I think some dedicated capacity building um, mechanism for civil society is going to be important. And just the last point, uh, you know, we've raised this issue of data and stats, and I think that's the elephant in the room. Um, uh, we, for instance, implemented a six million US dollar project to strengthen and upgrade our national statistical system. We're about just at the end point. But you're looking at changing laws, infrastructure, you're looking at um, just more persons um, in our stats offices. And, and if you look across the region, some require greater intervention than others. But I think we can't deal with this governance issue and this disaggregated, the need for disaggregated data and so forth, unless we deal with that structural issue of statistical reform. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. I already work very closely with Under Secretary General Wu and his colleagues, uh, but your idea of developing a module on training in these issues, uh, which combines face-to-face -face training with some e-learning, I think that's an idea worth pursuing. Blended training is what it's called, and I think it works, uh, and we'll focus on that. The last speaker. Thank you very much, um, Chia. Uh, I just wanted to raise, uh, I guess, a, a, to re-emphasize the importance, particularly in the context of the ticklish issue of corruption, um, the importance of moving towards open government policies, and in particular, freedom of information legislation or public access to information. Um, corruption tends to thrive when there's lots of secrecy. Um, secrecy tends to also lead to distortions within society. And I believe that the way we begin to tackle that is to introduce open government policies and particularly the legislation that will allow citizens to understand how government operates and how decisions are being made. Thank you. Thank you so much. But it has to be done practically because I've seen in many places where the right to information cripples bureaucracies permanently. They feel so crippled in doing anything that they're not willing to sign off on even a $10, um, you know, some contract. So we've got to find the right balance between the right to information and to keep the bureaucracies going uh, uh, the way they should. Before we conclude, I just wanted to give the floor once again to the moderators to see if what they've heard uh, in this session adds on to what they heard in theirs and if any parting observations they might have uh, for all of us. Thank you. Three points. And uh, there are two issues. Um, I think would deserve uh, more discussion and more detailed discussion uh, than we could uh, do this morning. The first is um, that it's, I think it's important to collect and, and also disseminate more examples of tools for long-term policy making, long-term uh, implementation of the SDGs, which is difficult um, because of the flip-flop governance of the every five years change of government. And we, we heard some examples how this could be done, like involving ho the whole of parliament. But I think it's very important and to, to share more examples about this. It could maybe deserve a, a small uh, seminar on its own. And the second topic is the, it's the same uh, for policy coherence tools. Tools to, to help silos to dance together. May, and, and these tools could be different in different cultures and different countries. But it would be nice maybe to share uh, good practices on this um, also on, on, on a common website or have a separate discussion on that. And the last point I wanted to say, come back to, uh, to the issue of, uh, of corruption, which is not my specialty, but my specialty is framing. And 
or reframing, and um, I immediately thought when, when con corruption is, we're not talking about marginal corruption, but when cor corruption is the system, is part of the system, then it means that it is part of the income of a group of people. And so maybe transparency is not enough, but you should also think of uh, seeing corruption as um, an income policy slash uh, poverty issue. And, um, and then maybe go on, on several tracks at the same time. But again, I'm not the expert, but it could help. Thanks. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you. Um, I mean, we've been talking about institutions and we acknowledge that this is a, this is a mix of both people and rules and ways we operate, etc. And one point that, that I missed saying in my sum up was that certainly in Dominican Republic and elsewhere, um, they have been able to bring in legal frameworks so that there is, for example, a connection between the planning priority and resourcing, whether you will get money for your project and criteria have to be met. And I think it's important that we hold in mind um, both the motivational requirement, the fact that we are dealing with human beings, we want them to have the spirit of carnival, but they also need to do it in a disciplined way, as it were. So we have to work with that complexity. And I think that what you demonstrated certainly in the, the group that I had was that people understand that and they can make hard choices in difficult circumstances um, and they can follow through on those difficult choices and as has been said that comes out of values that comes out of what we believe um, is important and what we should be able to do and I suppose my, my final point to you is that as a group as six um, I do hope that when we start talking about data and targets and aligning plans, etc., that, that the mechanisms, the documentation, as it were, do not displace what we are really trying to do, which is to make a difference with the SDGs, that we don't get caught up in our own elegance, if you like, of being professional civil servants. And we don't let that get in the way, and I think as a group within the UN context, um, I am no expert in, in, in these matters, but I think it is important that you shape that institution to help you to deliver. You know, so look at the systems and processes that you are operating, and you've shown the way you collaborate, the themes that have come up, etc. And so, you know, as Her Excellency said, you know, find ways within the system so that these statistics and you know so on do not become a stick to beat you with but they are what I think is hoped for which would be actually a source of evidence and advice and help. Thank you. Thank you Beatrice, thank you Louis, thank you everyone for your participation. I'm five minutes over time but I ask your indulgence for that and I see from the program we are back in this room at two o'clock to start the dialogue on effective partnership for implementing the SDGs. All I need to say now is bon appetit. <laughs>